Welcome to this week's Tanzu Tuesday. Uh, don't mind my lovely background here. Um, I'm somewhere in SF and there's these like foam things on the wall and I guess a lot of them have uh, fallen off. It's kind of weird because it's the first time I'm like in an actual office of any sort um, since this pandemic started. It's kind of, kind of nice. Um, anyway, so next week we have Nate Shuda. Um, I am having, I've been having a bunch of Git issues um, lately for some reason. It keeps like, I push a, a commit, it's now in mainline, and yet for some reason when I make a new PR, it's, it still has that commit as a new thing. But anyway, that'll be up a little bit later. So um, for next week, Nate Shuda is going to be talking about bridging the gap between ops and developers with CI CD. So to if you want to see more about that, um, check later today on tanzu.tv slash TT, and you'll be able to see it as the latest episode there. To see what we're going to be talking about today, if you also go to tanzu.tv slash TT slash 63, um, the topic is monitoring availability with error budget burn rate on Tanzu observability. So you can see uh, what the topic is like all the information and what's going to be happening for that here and soon enough we'll be talking about that so i have two lovely guests that are here with me today you two would like to introduce yourself sure uh my name is dave tillman i'm uh a uh, the tech lead on the steel toe project and um i'll be doing part of the presentation today h you want to go go ahead yeah, I'm Hananiel Sarella, and I'm another engineer on the Steeltoe team. And I have, uh, I'm going to be doing part of the presentation and uh, a couple of demos at the end. So back to you, Tiffany. So the random question. So if you could just like, didn't have to worry about it, you could go anywhere in the world and just like, what, like what, what's your favorite place? Wow, I don't know. H, you go first. I got to think about that I, one. I want to go to Colorado where Dave lives. <laughs> and there's a beautiful <laughs> place over there. So I think we'll go hang out. Yeah. But yeah, you know, there's so many places. I love traveling. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I always have loved Europe and haven't been over to Europe in a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to get back over there and do some traveling over that way. So Any that's favorite where places I go. in Europe? Uh, you know, France, love to love France. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I like, I like the UK, definitely like the UK as well. And um, uh, so it's probably two of my favorite. Um, I had, uh, for a while, I did a, a stint in, um, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, and did a, did a long, long stint over there when I was part of VMware earlier. And uh, actually really loved it, loved it over there as well. So Cool. Yeah, I have not been to Tel Aviv yet. I've heard great things and I've had multiple people, coworkers in like previous jobs go there for work and I just haven't yet. But like France and the UK is especially nice because you can just take that one train and cross the border and you're there. Yeah. Absolutely. Are either of you speaking uh, at uh, Spring One? We, um, not that I know of. But I don't think... I think we were, I think we were an alternate or a, a backup, yeah. I think, weren't we? Yeah. So, so I think the short answer cool. is yeah. no. So, <laughs> so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, we have a spring conference called Spring One. Um, and there's things with, specifically with spring, there's stuff about like Kubernetes and other things like that. If you go to springone.io, it is virtual this year. It is the first week of September and it is free. So go ahead and check that out. So yeah, um, I will let you two take off, take it off, and do your, your talk now. Okay, let me. Um, I'm going to start out. Let me share my screen. We've got a few slides. Um, so the subject today uh, is uh, we just finished up a a, a new release of uh, Steeltoe. Um, and uh, so we want to talk about two main 
features of uh, Steel Toe 3.1, which was the latest release we just got out the door a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it's spe specifically around the area of messaging and uh, stream processing. And um, so I'd like to cover that. And uh, that's where we're going to focus most of our time. But I did, I suspect there may be some people on uh, that are watching uh, or that will come back later and, and look at this and wonder really what Steel Toe is. So I thought I'd give a little bit of background about Steel Toe. Uh, first. So let me move into that. Um, it's an open source project I started back in uh, January of uh, 2016. My first commit was January 4th of uh, 2016. And uh, it's a complete, completely open source project. Uh, and of course, it's all focused on .NET and uh, uh, .NET uh, developers. Um, back in 2018, we actually contributed the entire project at that point to the .NET Foundation. So, um, so everything is licensed uh, through the .NET Foundation and the, the .NET Foundation license is a MIT license. And so uh, it's readily and freely available. Um, we support both the .NET full framework um, in our 2.x line, as well as uh, we support .NET Core and .NET 5. And um, .NET 6 is coming here soon. And uh, it's in, I think, maybe preview five or six right now. Uh, we will definitely have it on our radar, uh, probably with something like a Steel Toe 4, 4.0 4 kind of release uh, down the road. We've got lots of samples out there for how you can use uh, Steel Toe in your project. And I'll go into more detail about what really is all available to you um, as, steel, as, a, as a part of the Steel Toe framework. And so here's a link to uh, showing a link to the uh, samples repo that we have out there, which have some very good samples that, that go into the details individually about each of the components and how you can make use of them in your uh, .NET application. We've also got an online documentation website uh, shown there. And then uh, uh, some of us live on the Slack channel uh, that you can also join and get on and uh, get a lot of free help uh, as well through that. So if you get uh, run into problems using Steel Toe. So one of the things uh, it's important to have as part of the project is a kind of a focus area. And uh, so I've, I've, uh, I've put four bullet, four main bullets together here that try to, um, I guess, articulate kind of where we try to focus our time. And as we evaluate things uh, to do and, and, and technology to implement, we kind of try to uh, weigh that against uh, these kind of main focus areas. And so one of the things we, we do is we try to enable uh, .NET developers to build production grade uh, cloud native type microservices. And we do that by providing frameworks uh, packages, if you will, that we have found um, are, are necessary in order to, to, to be able to build microservices um, in a, you know, in a uh, production grade quality. Uh, so there's a, a whole set of uh, distributed systems patterns that you see used when you build uh, these uh, highly distributed systems based on microservices. Um, and we try to provide out of the box uh, capabilities to make it easy for developers to adopt some of these best system or these best practices or, um, or patterns that you would typically use. Things like externalized configuration, service discovery, circuit breaking, bulkhead uh, principles, um, distributed tracing, the list goes on and on. I have a slide in a few minutes that show you kind of some of the areas that we provide packages for. And as I said, we started this uh, project, uh, uh, I, I, as I said, about, about five years ago. And so there's actually quite a rich set of uh, um, packages to, to uh, enable developers to implement some of these uh, best practices. The other focus that we have is we also believe um, in the idea that uh, you've got some .NET code and you need to run it uh, on a cloud platform. Um, we, want to, we want to make sure that you can run it on any cloud platform. And so we really focus on abstractions. So when we talk about externalized configuration or service discovery, we try to provide abstractions for those kinds of services such that you can implement your code, make use of service discovery, and you should be able to take it to any cloud platform. We don't believe in this idea of uh, being tied to a, specific plat to a specific cloud platform. That being said, of course, we are VMware, so we are very focused on the Tanzu application service, for example. Today, we support quite, uh, quite well uh, and additional Tanzu platforms as they continue to emerge out of, out of VMware. That will clearly be our focus, but that being said, you should be able to take our technology 
and our abstractions and, and make use of them on other cloud platforms as well. The other thing that we try to focus on as well as a differentiator for our project is we truly believe in polyglot based microservices. And uh, we, the, the Steeltoe team, we're actually part of the Java Spring team believe it or not. And so one of the things we focus off, in fact, I'm a Java, I'm a Java Spring developer uh, originally uh, and uh, have worked on .NET as well, but we believe in out of the box integration between uh, Java Spring and .NET microservices. A lot of our large enterprises uh, have development and applications and are building microservices uh, using both Java and .NET. And so um, we want to make sure that if you adopt uh, Steeltoe, that and you also are using in your enterprise Java and Spring that you just get out of the box interoperability between the two. For example, well, today we'll talk about messaging. If you create a message uh, and in a .NET microservice and want to send it to a Java Spring microservice, Java Spring based microservice, say over a RabbitMQ connection, out of the box, the integration and the ability to do that uh, just comes natural. And we also then, of course, you'll find that the Java Spring team also uh, uses a lot or implements a lot of these same distributed systems patterns that I talked about earlier. For example, external, external, externalized configuration. And so, for example, when we support a config server for externalizing configuration, we actually, are, we actually support the Java Spring config server uh, as that backend service. And so whether you're a Java developer or a .NET developer, you have one way in which you can externalize your configuration data and one way in which you can consume it as well, whether you're Java or .NET. So those are some of the things that we try to focus on as we, uh, as we do the project. And then last but not least is uh, developer productivity tools. We, tr we truly believe in, you know, that, that the, the Visual Studio and the development tools that you, that um, .NET developers use today, we ought to make it very easy for Steeltoe to be incorporated and, and, to, and to be used in those environments. So for example, today we, we're working on a, um, on a uh, Visual Studio plugin for uh, Tanzu application service to make it very easily for .NET developers to interact with that backend platform. So those are kind of the four focus areas that we try to try to uh, uh, keep our project uh, driving towards. So here are some of the various features and I've organized them uh, kind of by the uh, uh, feature functionality that uh, is provided by them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, for example, we have circuit breaker technology. We, we implemented the uh, uh, a .NET version of the .NET, uh, I'm sorry, of the uh, Netflix Hystrix technology for circuit breaking, uh, as well as the bulkhead uh, kind of principles that you get with, uh, with uh, Hystrix. Uh, we have client-side load balancing uh, that you typically used in a REST-based uh, uh, environment. We have lots of uh, features for observability. For example, we uh, implemented the management endpoints much like the Java Spring team did so that uh, you're able to uh, expose what are called the actuator endpoints for managing your microservices for, for uh, observing, getting information out of them. Uh, we support distributed tracing uh, and, and again, interoperability when it comes to Java and Spring. So uh, if you, for example, want to incorporate a Zipkin trace server or you want to do Zipkin tracing, uh, we have features that enable that uh, out of the box as well. So lots of things uh, provided today uh, with Steeltoe and Steeltoe 3.1. One of the areas that we have um, added in 3.1 then is kind of new, is this uh, uh, Steeltoe messaging and uh, support for stream processing, which is kind of the focus of uh, this session today. And this is uh, the messaging stuff we actually had in 3.0 of uh, Steeltoe. We did do some additional features and, and some updates to it uh, in 3.1. And then uh, stream processing as a feature is uh, new for, for 3.1. Now, in order to try to put uh, some context around this messaging and uh, stream processing stuff, I thought I would just quickly go through and kind of set the stage for uh, some terminology and uh, a, a way of looking at microservices. So I put together a quick slide that just shows on the left, the old monolith way of looking at an application compared to the right where we've now uh, built it or, or organized it and architected it as a bunch of microservices. And uh, I've uh, put in place here on the on the right side, then kind of the attributes, if you will, uh, about what it's all about to to uh, adopt and use microservices and some of the some of the uh, 
characteristics of, of uh, what a good microservices based architecture is all about. And uh, you know, one of the things that it enables, of course, is polyglot based applications. So some of those microservices could be Java Spring microservices, some could be .NET uh, steel toe based microservices. And, and again, not to, not to uh, uh, let's keep saying the same thing over and over again, but interoperability between those two worlds is one of our focus areas. But now one of the things that happens as a result of uh, architecting your application in a bunch of microservices is that typically these microservices run in different processes. Normally we see them now being deployed as uh, containers uh, or, or as pods, meaning multiple containers inside a pod. Uh, and most likely they're running on different machines. And so in order for these microservices to interoperate or to communicate with one another, it takes some sort of IPC technology uh, to enable the interactions between the mic between the different services that you have making up an application. And uh, there's a great book. I, I actually don't know this gentleman or, or um, you know, I'm not, certainly not trying to plug, plug his book, but there's a book called uh, Microservices Patterns by a guy named Chris Richardson. It's a great, great book. I, I, at least I found it uh, very comprehen uh, comprehensive and uh, understandable for me. And so I lifted uh, this, di this uh, diagram that shows the different interaction styles. I borrowed it from him, but I'm also giving obviously him credit for this. Um, the uh, interaction styles that you typically see in, in uh, between microservices when you're building out an application. And on the top, we see the kinds of interactions, whether it's a one-to-one -one or one-to-many uh, communications that take place between microservices. And then down on the, on the left, uh, we see a lot of times uh, the characteristics of whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. And, um, you know, we typically think about synchronous types, one-to-one uh, -one communication or request reply, and the kinds of technology that you use in order to implement that kind of interaction style is something like a remote procedure call, like a gRPC kind of technology, or an HTTP REST type uh, uh, interaction, right? And uh, you know, any of anybody that's been doing microservices has used probably both of those or has uh, uh, certainly uh, used at least HTT REST uh, kind of technology for doing this synchronous one-to-one uh, -one type communications. A little less frequent, but certainly happens more and more is the async uh, interactions where we have, uh, can be both one-to-one requ uh, -one request reply kind of thing or request and no reply, or one-to-many is uh, also very common with the async kind of kind of interaction style. And uh, the underlying technology that's used there is uh, typically some sort of messaging technology, right? RabbitMQ, Kafka, that kind of, kind of stuff. And so this is one of the areas with, uh, with Steeltoe 3.0 and 3.1, where we, we tried, to, tried to really focus. But let me drill into these a little bit more. So if we take a look at the synchronous HTTP REST type uh, interactions, um, one of the things you see is that it, first of all, it's very familiar for developers. Uh, request reply is very much like a method call. Uh, it's a synchronous type operation. You invoke the method, you get back the response or get back the, the data as a result of the, of the method call. Um, but it's also a much more tighter uh, runtime coupling mechanism, right? Both ends must be available. Um, and as a result of that, uh, it can reduce the overall app availability, right? If, if both the uh, client and the uh, server uh, are, uh, are required to be uh, active, right? And it typically requires then as a result of that, some additional distributed system patterns to be applied to this uh, type of interaction style, right? So I've mentioned various ones uh, earlier, like for example, service discovery, circuit breaking, uh, bulkhead pattern, client side load balancing. These kinds of kinds of services are typically built around or on top of, or the the uh, code that a developer uses in order to say do an RPC call or an HTTP REST call would then make use of these additional services. And Steeltoe today and has from from pretty much day one has add has had features like that available for uh, application developers. And these are the kind of things you need in order to make truly uh, production ready, um, you know, uh, a large scale distributed microservices type applications. And today we support that pretty, pretty, pretty well today and have for quite a while. When we got to the messaging side of, of things, uh, we see now a, a different kind of interaction style going on. And we see that in between now, we have this thing called a message broker, some sort of intermediary 
that uh, handles things like message buffering and various other kinds of things. And so you can see that from, from this kind of thing, we, we have much, much less uh, runtime uh, coupling uh, at, that, at this point, right? So the, the, the uh, client uh, microservice issues a message to the message broker. The message broker does what it needs to do in order to get it uh, forwarded on to the, to the receiver. So it's a, it can support, this model can support both one-to-one -one and one-to-many kind of communications. It can support both synchronous, but most, and uh, as well, but most of the time you see this in a more of an asynchronous uh, mechanism. Now the broker does add some additional systems complexity. Uh, for example, a broker could perform, become a performance bottleneck or could act as a single point of failure, but most technologies out to there today, whether it's RabbitMQ or Kafka, have ways in which to deal with that. So it typically isn't, uh, isn't uh, much of a problem uh, anymore in these days. And then this uh, model also supports lots of really advanced scenarios and patterns that you typically see implemented uh, uh, when using this type, type of technology. Things like partitioning and sharding, which uh, uh, Han and Neil will talk about later when it comes to stream processing, competing consumer uh, patterns, et cetera. It's an it's a interesting technology. So this is an area with uh, Steel Toe 3.0 and 3.1 we ended up focusing a lot of time on. And then you, if you also take a look at uh, microservices and look at the categories of uh, interactions between uh, that a microservice can, can offer up, uh, somebody did a great job of kind of categorizing all the interactions into uh, three categories, uh, things that are commands and queries. And uh, these are things like a command is where you execute some business process or task and then return the result of that. Like for example, creating an order, creating customer. The interaction style is typically synchronous or one-to-one. -one. Uh, and then queries are more, uh, you know, you need to find some information and the microservice needs to provide some way of uh, discovering or providing some information or data back to the client. Uh, things like FIDE order, FIDE customer order. Uh, and again, it's very similar, a synchronous one-to-one -one, uh, kind, of, kind of an in interaction style is typically what you see. Now, in addition to that, there's in some, some this other category called events. And um, this is where uh, with an event, uh, event type communications, you're, you're essentially trying to communicate that something happened or something changed. And so a microservice, for example, may consume events of that nature, or it may actually may produce events of that nature. So for example, a customer got deleted, some other microservice may need to know that, or an order got created. And this is where we begin to see uh, the async uh, could be one-to-one -one or one-to-many style of communications. And any given microservice uh, can implement one or or uh, more of these kinds of uh, categories of the, of the interaction. And this is where, so, so up until uh, SteelToe 3.0, we had some great support for commands and queries and making those kinds of interaction styles, production quality, um, resilient, you know, all those kinds of things that you would want in a production type application. What we didn't support, what we didn't offer much is in the way, in the way of events. And uh, in SteelToe 3.1, we, we began to, to add that, to actually steal to 3 to 3.0 and 3.1. So let me take, let's take a, a mo moment and look at what we've done in uh, 3.0 and 3.1. So what we added was support for messaging and streams, uh, stream processing. And uh, what we did is again, we, we we're all about abstractions, as I mentioned earlier. We're providing essentially a programming model with a set of abstractions that allow you to build event-driven microservices and stream-based uh, data processing type applications. In the case of messaging, what we have today is we've got support for RabbitMQ, but we've also put in place a set of abstractions that will work with not only RabbitMQ, but additional messaging systems down the road. For example, uh, Kafka is definitely on our radar. And we have things like a listening container so that uh, you can easily spin up, a con not, not to be confused with a, you know, a, a Docker container or a OCI container, but think of it as a, a set of uh, processing logic that uh, spins up and starts receiving and can process incoming messages 
uh, for uh, a particular application. We have a template for sending and receiving messages. We have admin clients for interacting with the actual message broker for declaring queues, topics, and that sort of thing. And we're trying to provide abstractions on top of that to make it very easy and for you uh, for developers to make use of uh, in their applications, regardless of what underlying messaging system you're using. And then we take it another level. Uh, another, we added another level of abstraction on top of that in order to support stream stream based processing applications, where we begin to formalize things like producers and consumers and processors uh, for messages. <clears throat> we implement we provide this concept called a binder which essentially is an abstraction on top of the underlying messaging system. And then we add uh, this idea of a, of a destination binding, which ties together the uh, producers, consumers, and processors with the actual binder implementation. And it makes it very seamless for application developers to implement stream data processing. So let me take a few minutes to just to quickly give you an idea of the messaging stuff. Uh, we've got uh, abstractions at, for defining what a message is, for what a message header is, how to build a message. Uh, we've got this templating technology for sending and receiving messages. And then built into this, uh, all interweaved into this is support for message converters. So uh, you are able to send a object, for example, an order, and the uh, implementation of the message converter technology will uh, convert it into whatever is needed in order to get it across the wire uh, on the messaging system. For example, a RabbitMQ message. We also have a bunch of attributes that we, we provide that allow for controlling uh, and extracting things in and out of messages. For example, let's say you have a method that you just want to extract the payload out of, you have the ability to tag uh, uh, variables and, and uh, uh, arguments uh, for, for that kind of stuff. And so all these attributes are provided uh, out of the box with steel toe. And these kinds of things apply to all different kinds of messaging, uh, underlying messaging systems. And then for each type of messaging system that we support, today it's RabbitMQ, in the future we'll add Kafka, we provide specializations in the implementations for each of those uh, underlying technologies. And so here's a full list of the RabbitMQ messaging um, specializations that we've done, uh, various message converters, we've got a rabbit listener attribute that you can decorate a method with, and it will then handle incoming processing for, for incoming messages. We've got an admin client for declaring uh, bindings, exchanges, et cetera, on RabbitMQ. And then we've got a RabbitMQ host that you can use to configure the DI service container uh, in a .NET application. And here's an example uh, to, just to show you how easy it is to stand up a, a, a rabbit listener, essentially, a RabbitMQ listener. Uh, what we're showing here, for those who are .NET developers, this code should look pretty uh, pretty familiar, but we, when you're building your host builder, um, we now provide a RabbitMQ host where you can uh, create a default builder and then configure the service context, I'm sorry, the service container with the kinds of things you need in order to uh, get your RabbitMQ server up and running. In this case, what we see here is we're adding a RabbitMQ queue. Its, Q, uh, its name is called MyQ. And what this does is when the RabbitMQ host starts up and your .NET application starts up and starts running, the underlying uh, technology provided by Steeltoe will go out and actually uh, declare this queue for you and get it up and running and available on the RabbitMQ broker. And then we add, uh, in this case, this example, we add this uh, RabbitMQ RabbitMQ listener. So we define a class, the class is shown below here called my rabbit listener. And uh, we tell the uh, steel toe components to add that as a, uh, as a rabbit, MQ, uh, as a rabbit listener. And then if you look down, whoops, if you look down below here, you see the annotation on this method called listen. And it says, it basically is defining this class rabbit listener to listen for messages that will come in off of the MyQ. And so behind the scenes, the steel toe technology goes off and creates this container that I mentioned earlier that uh, uses um, you know, um, connection caching, all kinds of technologies in order to make it very robust and resilient for failure and recoverability. Uh, and it connects to the RabbitMQ broker and uh, it connects to the MyQ and then begins to listen for any messages that come in off of that RabbitMQ queue. And if it, if it begins to receive any, uh, it will deliver them to this particular method called listen 
and it will convert whatever is coming in and try to convert it into a string as an input. In this case, all we do is log it. And so that's how simple it e and simple and easy it is to get a uh, steel toe uh, uh, messaging RabbitMQ messaging application up and uh, up and running uh, on your uh, on your system. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to hand this over to uh, Hananiel and let him go ahead and build on top of this messaging technology and uh, describe to you what we've done with uh, Steel Toe Streams. He'll also be giving uh, some demos uh, showing how you can make use of this uh, in uh, uh, various uh, data flow and so forth. So take it away, Hanil. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Um, we've kind of listened to uh, the kind of the components and the abstractions that are available in uh, Steel to messaging and continuing that story with uh, abstractions and polyglot interop interoperability, we have streams bringing, extending that model. And the way it does that is with these uh, components, if you will. And, and Dave already briefly mentioned, you know, the rabbit binder, for example, which is a binder implementation that allows your code to talk to, uh, to a, a RabbitMQ broker without being tied down to it. So it kind of separates your code from that, making it portable. So tomorrow, if you want to replace the binder with a Kafka binder, you will be able to without changing any of your code. And the second main idea and a component, the way these abstractions uh, amount to essentially a programming model is creating uh, an interface for binding your code whether it's producing some data, consuming some data, or processing some data uh, to the binder. So that, that's the idea of uh, destination binding. And obviously we need a way to communicate between all these uh, diverse components and that's a message. So that's where your um, data conversion happens uh, from when it's going from data moving across the wire between processes uh, in, a, in a completely different system. Uh, so let's look at that in a little more a pictorial format. So on the left-hand side, you have a steel to stream microservice, uh, which is a .NET application, and it uses the steel to stream libraries, and it communicates to uh, as many brokers as there are implementations for it. And not only that, one of the things we do at Silto is exposes abstractions and interfaces that so that people can build on top of these things. You can, for example, build your own binder for some service uh, that uh, nobody has thought of is not popular. So that a lot that creates great flexibility for uh, teams. And to continue the conversation that Dave started about polyglot interoperability, this is also how uh, Steel to Stream brings us. Uh, to a place where we can play along nicely with Spring Boot microservices and seamlessly uh, integrate with these kind of uh, infrastructures. We'll be looking at an example shortly, but by tying your code to these well-defined abstractions, and these are uh, established, well-established enterprise integration patterns that these technologies are built on top of, and that allows you to take advantage of them instead of reinventing the wheel, if you will, and uh, allow you to focus on business logic. So let's look at the stream abstractions. We looked at the messaging abstractions. Here are the stream abstractions. And the main idea here is a binder, obviously. So basically, this is the component that uh, builds basically on top of, in our case, uh, seal to messaging to talk to specific brokers. So for example, you saw the Rabbit admin, you can imagine um, Kafka admin uh, and so on that will be implementations that will be provided. And these are exposed uh, so that you can implement your own binders and bindings as well. And the three main interfaces, bindable interfaces that Steel Toe provides baked in into the project is the uh, iSource, iProcessor and iSync. We'll be looking at this a lot. And basically the thing to understand if you're not familiar with this is to know that a source has a one output channel and acts as a source of data. So self-explanatory really, and an icing has one input channel 
and it becomes, uh, you know, it uh, receives data. And a processor inherits both of these interfaces and has one input and one output. Now you can always, Silda makes it really easy to add your own interfaces. I, I feel with multiple inputs and multiple outputs, uh, but out, out, out of the box, these three uh, are pretty powerful as you will see shortly. So one of the ways the Silto uh, uh, library, stream library exposes these abstractions is the use of .NET attributes. So you're familiar with .NET attributes being used for your MVC uh, application development or data annotations uh, or ORM annotations. It's a similar idea and it uh, is really analogous to the uh, Spring Cloud stream uh, attributes. And the first is obviously the enable binding attribute that lets your application take a set of interfaces that you can uh, allow the stream host uh, and allow the stream, uh, Silto stream to use these attributes, use these interfaces to bind specific pieces of user logic uh, to be either a producer or consumer of code. But these are the main attributes to note. I think they'll make more sense when looking in the context of code. So let's look at a quick code example. So what we have here is a, a standalone single class, single file, a complete steel to stream application. And so the first thing to note here is this thing called a stream host. .NET developers are familiar with the generic host that's available or the web host. Uh, this stream host is basically inherited, derives from the same generic host, builds on top of it. It has all the goodness that it adds like logging providers and so forth. And it adds some more components. Now stream applications are basically long running applications for a very specific need. They deal with data in motion and data ingestion, data transformation, things like that. So they're long running process. The stream host sets up the stream container which contains all of these components and long running processes behind that listen to the broker, uh, create queues for you when needed or create topics when, uh, if, it's, if you're binding to Kafka and so forth. So that's what in a nutshell, the stream host does. Now, the second important thing is uh, enable binding attribute that tells that this class is a source or a destination for data. And it takes in this case, an I processor. An I processor as we described earlier, has one input and one output. So it seems um, pretty clear, uh, but let's go look at some code and actually type this up in a IDE and see what that feels like and how easy it is to actually uh, talk to a rabbit broker in our case. So here I have a RabbitMQ uh, running locally and there's Nothing, it looks a little weird because it's so zoomed in, but uh, hopefully everybody can see that. And here I have an empty folder. So let's start with, um, there is something called a uh, Stilto initializer. I would encourage uh, um, everybody to look at it. Uh, and um, um, you know, you can obviously start from here and you have all these good examples that come, but I, I just want to see what the steps that take, you know, it's, uh, and not get bogged down to what magic that added. You can see literally how simple uh, developing a steel to stream application is. So you can start from a .NET new console. There are also steel to uh, templates available, but let's just start with the standard .NET console template from Microsoft. And it obviously um, creates you know, uh, these two files. So let's add some uh, packages to our uh, project. And uh, I'm gonna use my history to help me with that. So we're gonna add a package called RabbitMQ, steal to stream binder RabbitMQ, and add another one. called stream base. So once you have those two packages in your product, you can open any IDE. In this case, I'm using um, writer. 
So pulling up here. So once you have it up here, let me zoom out a little bit so everybody can watch what is happening. I guess that's all the zoom I have here. Hopefully you can see it. Um, but you can start typing stream host. What's going on? I'm not getting my IntelliSense to work here. The font's also very small. Yeah, let me make it bigger. Um, Is that any better? Much. All right. Let me build this, uh, let me tab out of here. And do a quick dot. Using, using statement up above. Yeah, I'm expecting it to type it for me and show how simple that is uh, to happen. But of course, when we're doing a demo, <laughs> it <laughs> things start <laughs> acting up. And it, you know, usually it just types that. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not seeing this at all. Um, check, check your project file. Make sure you got things added right. You're in the right folder. Tanzu demo. You know what? I know what it is. It opened it as a folder as opposed to a project. So uh, let me yeah. close this and open it back up. And this time I must have accidentally clicked, just open the data tree. All right, so let's see here. Yeah, it's, it's doing stuff now. So let, let it finish its thing. Okay, there we go. Now you see the green squiggles, you know you're you're working. <laughs> Stream host dot there you go. So now you you're getting all kinds of intelligence help uh, to create, and it has one method on it called the create default builder, which is similar to the generic host. And you have the we're going to pass it. This class is a single class application. You can pass other classes, but for right now we will do this. And we call this method called run console, I think, which sets up a console application. And we're going to go ahead and make this an async await. All right. So we're not done yet. We talked about the enable binding attribute here. And we're going to pass it a type, a type of I processor. And that tells the application to look for certain methods and certain annotations here. So we'll create a simple method here that takes a string and returns a string. Call it handle. You can call it anything you want. Um, and in this case, we'll pretend like we're doing some kind of uh, processing and what we are going to be doing is very trivial. We're going to simply take the input and to uppercase it. And to help us see what the application is doing, I'm gonna put some console.write lines here and say received the input and Another one that says, oops, go up here and says sending output. And of course, we are going to return the transformed data. All right, so one more thing. We want to tell the application that this can receive data. And so we use a stream listener 
annotation and um, give it an iProcessor input and a send to attribute that uh, Dave talked about from messaging and give it the output destination. So now if you notice, we haven't configured anything yet. We haven't given any names, but let's go ahead and run this application and see what it does. So I think I got that right. So let's do a .NET build, make sure. Everything looks good. So you can see it created an anonymous input and created a queue here in your queues on the RabbitMQ local broker. So by default, it binds to your local, local host. So it makes it really easy for local application development. And then in a second, we'll see how easy it is to uh, pass configuration to it as well. So let's uh, say hi Tanzu and publish this message. And so you can see that it received and it's sending data. So that's how simple that is. You know, we literally had like one class and um, and basically one, one little method and these annotations are powerful. And here you can imagine much more complex things. Uh, in a second, we'll see something a little more um, has a, a couple more moving parts to it. Right now, let me add some. Uh, it's also probably worth noting at this point, Hananil, that there's nothing in this in this code that's RabbitMQ, right? Yes. So, so the only thing, the only reason it's communicating to RabbitMQ is because you added the RabbitMQ binder as a dependency yes. in yeah. the app. Mm -hmm. So, if you were to switch that out and change it to a Kafka binder, that same code would run, just would be using Kafka instead. Absolutely. Power of abstractions. Power of abstractions, yes. So let's go ahead and add a, a file um, called app settings.json. Type it. All right. So let's copy some configuration there uh, that I have set out here. Now, one of the things, uh, so if you're wondering what's all this config, uh, you know, let me kind of nuke out some of it real quick. And as you start typing, you can see that it, uh, it, there's help available for you through the schema uh, example. So if you add the Stilto schema and you can see the Stilto schema repository, you can add these configurations. And uh, what we're saying essentially here is we're telling it the bindings. We, we have a input and output binding defined inside and we're just giving it a name. So let's see what that does to the project. So let's go ahead and save this and again, build and So now you see that it has a name here uh, and it's configured its input and output. Uh, you know, you can't really see the output where it's going, but it's putting it back on the, on the, on the same queue. But again, um, so you can see this working exactly like that. So you see the input and output coming out. So that's, that's how easy it is and how, um, abstracted away from the actual broker implementation. Uh, but this story gets even better if you consider uh, working with the polyglot part of the part of what, what we were talking about. So let's go back here and look at a slightly better or not better, but uh, an example with more moving parts. So we have this example that I want to show you, it's called the usage cost sender or usage cost. And basically what it's doing is an application that has a producer, it's uh, generating records. It's kind of a simulator of phone calls and the amount of phone uh, 
uh, number of minutes in the phone call and the amount of data they use. So it's sending for each user a number of uh, these kind of records over to something called the processor. And the processor is going to do some batch, uh, not batch, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, doing an in inline one after the other updates on this and sending it to a, a sync. So that's what it actually looks like. In our case, we're going to use WebDM queue. So there's a queue and these queues will get tied in. And I wanna show you how easy it becomes when combined with externalized configuration to do these sort of applications. Uh, and it becomes really easy if you have something like a sentiment analysis of tweets or uh, how new products are doing, these this kind of applications will leverage the capabilities that are being showcased here. So the last thing I wanna talk about and take this application to something called Spring Cloud Dataflow. Now, if you're not familiar with it, it is um, an orchestration tool. Now, Spring Cloud Stream is built for data-based applications that deal with data ingestion, data processing, and so forth. Now, Steel to Stream, uh, sorry, Spring Cloud Dataflow allows you to orchestrate these services, uh, build continue, continuous integration pipelines on top of them. It has uh, a number of capabilities that we don't have time to cover right now, but I would recommend starting with this website here called uh, dataflow.spring.io. It has a web dashboard and we'll look at that, but I won't be able to show you all the features that it has. And its main components are a Dataflow server, which gives you the GUI. Uh, or it, pre it presents itself as a GUI that you can add streams, add applications and so forth. And also a skipper that uh, schedules things. So um, let me head over again to a different window. And let's see how we're doing on time here. All my clocks are invisible. Okay, we got five minutes. So, so what I have here is, uh, so Spring Cloud Dataflow runs both on Kubernetes uh, or cloud uh, environment like cloud, cloud Foundry or TAS or also locally. Here I have a Kubernetes cluster set up. Um, and let's look at it. Right, so I have uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow set up and running. So let me uh, expose that over the, uh, from the pod to my local space, of course. Um, let me export some variables and forward the port. So we've got this port forwarding happening. And so you have this, uh, let me make this. Yeah, so this is the interface that Spring Cloud Dataflow shows. And I've kind of already installed these applications, but I'll show you how easy it is to add a new application. Let's call it, uh, let's say maybe Townsend Demo, add a processor such as the one we just built. Uh, for .NET uh, samples currently, we support uh, Docker. So you're going to publish your uh, application as a Docker container. And once it's available, right here, this is a VMware private repository with Harbor, uh, but you can use uh, Docker, uh, Docker Hub if you want. And, uh, and that's as simple. So these applications become available. Once they're available, what you can do is uh, create a stream. Like so you have this uh, nice GUI that allows you to drag and drop your applications and allows you to tie them together, right? So random sync. Um, so this, this becomes a stream application. So these types of applications, if you notice, tie into those uh, abstractions and the interfaces that we talked about. A source is basically input or a producer, sorry, uh, an output or a producer, a processor takes an input and sends an output and so forth. So, and you create a stream and call it, say, Tanzu stream. And yeah. So, so here I've already created another such stream. And this one, I, what I did is you are looking at the um, exact same code. In fact, let me dive in and uh, show you the code that we use for this. Um, Let's see here. So, oops. 
I went a little bit out of order there that I should have shown you the project first, but that's fine. You can now look at Spring Cloud data flow. Um, so. Again, these uh, samples are available on our repo uh, that Dave talked about, and I'll leave a note on the last slide there about uh, where you can find the samples. And um, if Dave sends me it in the chat here, I can post it in Twitch chat. Okay. Yeah, I was more prepared than I was, but I forgot I have this open already here. So <laughs> let's look at this uh, sample. So first we have the usage logger sample. And if you look at the usage logger program, so you have something very similar to what we saw earlier, but in this case, we're adding a few more things like adding actuators and so on, so that it can register with Kubernetes and show you the health and make sure that um, this same application can be deployed as is to Cloud Foundry. So we can add Cloud Foundry configuration. Uh, so I wanted to show you that you can deploy the same Docker image and send it to multiple locations. And as far as the application itself, uh, so I'm in the logger, let me send you to the sender first. And this generator is basically um, uh, a task, a background task that continuously runs and every five seconds it's posting some data to an input. And the shape of the data looks like this. So you have a user, user ID duration and data. So it's just generating random data and it's sending it over to the processor, which again, looks very similar. Um, you have a stream host and it's adding a bunch of um, uh, stuff to the stream host container. And you have the processor, which is very similar to the application you just saw. And it's doing a simple transformation here of the data and to create a detail. And so in this case, you can notice that the input is a usage detail, but it returned a different data called usage cost detail. And now these applications don't share the same namespace and they're in completely different namespaces, but the message converters seamlessly convert them. And not only that, you have, uh, you have the usage logger here written in .NET, and there's a very similar application written in Java. And uh, let's see if I can get to it real quick here. Yeah, so. That's fine, I think I, oh, there it is. There it is. And so the Java application looks very similar to the .NET application, except that you notice they're not using their annotations or attributes, they're using convention-based um, way of doing the exact, like the exact same thing. And it looks slightly different, but you, the thing to notice here is they're using the same usage cost detail described in Java that has the same shape, but it's an entirely different namespace. And now we can see, uh, now that we looked at the code, let's go back to the GUI. and uh, go ahead and deploy this application. So deploy this application, let's see what, what happens here. Let's uh, see what parts are being created. So you can see that this new steel to stream has new applications running here, it's getting ready. We can, uh, Try to get some logs out of here and see what, what they're doing because uh, so you can see that the usage center is continuously running and sending some usage detail data. And again, um, let's watch the processor and it's uh, receiving and it's processing this data. And this is a Java logger. 
So that was written in Java and it's uh, published as a Docker container. And you see the uh, it, it receiving the data and successfully printing that. So you can see now how you can build on top of these abstractions and achieve this portability and also interoperability with other systems. Uh, another thing I'd like to show is this exact same application running on Cloud Foundry. Uh, just give me a second here. I think uh, I've kind of closed my windows, but we can uh, really quickly run to Cloud Foundry. Uh, let me open up. Apps Manager in the place where I deployed it. Okay, here, let me drag this over so you can see that. So here's my task environment and uh, what this looks like in TAS, you've got um, your services and one of the services, of course, uh, the data flow application, you go to manage that. And there I've already uh, published this application also uh, ran the pipeline or deployed the stream. So you've got some streams here and this has already been deployed. So you can see it's, see the runtime, observe the runtime, see the details and um, you can actually go back to Apps Manager and see all of the applications running right there. Let's see. The playground, apps. Okay, there, there is your, there's your apps. These are the same applications. It's the exact same container. And if you see here, you get all these uh, Stilter goodies, health, trace, logs, uh, dynamic log levels, and so on. And here you see your um, uh, log output, data output. So that pretty much sums up how uh, easy uh, Stilter stream makes it, makes your application portable. Um, and here are my slides. Let me get back to those. And uh, makes it easy for you to not worry about things like which broker are we currently using tomorrow. This exact same application that you built your business logic on can be moved over to Kafka uh, without, without making any code changes or taking it to a different cloud environment. So what's left, what's next for Silto is obviously to add the um, add support for Kafka and other cloud-based systems. And, um, and of course, PRs are welcome. Uh, and you know you can um, go to the GitHub that's still to get uh, still to GitHub and just uh, submit a PR and uh, you know you can talk to us on Slack. But yeah, that pretty much concludes my demo and presentation. And uh, thank you for joining us. And I'll hand it back to Tiffany or Dave. That was great, uh, H. That was really super. Um, you showed a lot of the features of Steel Toe. That was fantastic. Thanks a ton. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you. This was really cool. Like, yeah, it's our. I think it's our second uh, talk that we've had at all on Steel Toe. So just kind of adding some more .NET and everything into Taunted Tuesdays is especially nice. Thank you to you both for um, talking today. And thanks everyone for attending. The video will later be up on YouTube on the same page that this episode is. So tonsu.tv slash tt slash 63. So that'll be up later. So if you want to watch it again, you can do that. And again, if you have not signed up for Spring One, uh, you can register for Spring One on springone.io. And there are a bunch of talks that are coming up, and that'll be the first week of September. And then next week, we have the episode for next week for Tonsu Tuesdays is up. So that's 
tanzu.tv slash tt slash 64. And that's with Nate Shuda. So same time, 12 o'clock Pacific time and come join us. So thanks you two.